Welcome to the studio, Sakir. Thank you coming. very much, Nick. Thanks for coming on board. And let's get straight to the calls. Uh, first up, it's going to be Mark in Wandsworth. You're through to Sakir Starmer. Go ahead, sir. Your question. Uh, good morning. Morning, Mark. Yeah, okay. Mr. Mr. Starmer, good morning. I call you Mr. Starmer because I often think if you drop the search here, you wouldn't sound like a Conservative. And in fact, <laughs> I'm a floating voter. But anyway, my question is, why I don't see any sense of politicians leading our country or showing that sense of duty and supporting us in crisis. We all have to rally together and put the country first to get through this crisis. So if Labour got into government, and who knows what will happen in a year or whenever the next election is, but will Labour in government, or even now, stand up to the unions and prevent this consistent attitude of strikes permeating through to society? And, of course, Putin must be rubbing his hands together, seeing how Great Britain is falling apart. So what would Labour do? Uh, Mark, look, uh, thanks for the call. Um, Nobody wants to see these strikes go ahead, including those who are going on strike. If you think about the nurses, um, the last thing they want to do is to go on strike. Um, They haven't been on strike ever before. Um, But we need a government. I mean, it's really your words, Mark. We need a government that is going to lead from the front and to get off their hands and get around the table. And I don't know what you think, Mark, but I think many people listening would find it bizarre that um, in relation to the nurses strike the nurses union are saying if the government gets around the table we can call this off this is due to go ahead on thursday um for the government to sit this out with what two or three days to go i think shows a profound lack of leadership um we need the government to get around the table now look and it's not just one area um mark there are strikes in various different sectors it's very difficult to portray this as you know all the fault of the trade unions when you've got this many people taking action on this scale you've got to look at what the government is up to and they're sitting on their hands they're sitting this one out and i think that many people who are going to be put out by these strikes in whatever area it is um, this week are saying, we'll, we'll say, why doesn't the government get off its hands, get around the table and negotiate? And Mark, that's what I would do. And I ran a public service, Mark, you may know, for five years, the Crown Prosecution Service. We had two trade unions we negotiated with. And in the end, what you have to do as a leader is get around the table, sort the problems out and resolve the issues. And that's what I want from the government. I think that's what many, many people listening will want from the government. They're not seeing that leadership. Let's get a quick response. So one sentence response. Mark. Yeah, uh, my response is I, I don't think any politicians are, li- are showing leadership on what our country should do, the duty to the country in crisis. And also, why should anyone be guaranteed an increase in pay every year? You know, if you're independent, you're your salesperson, you eat what you kill. And similarly now, the country's in crisis. They can't afford to pay people more money. So we've all got to knuckle down, do what's best for the country. And when we get through it, we can then discuss what people should be paid. But right now, there is no more money around and Putin is rubbing his hands. We're playing into his hands. All right, quick response from that and then we'll move on to Keir. Well, Mark, as I say, I, I think we want to see this resolved. I want to see the government step up. I mean, they've been sitting this one out. This has been going on for five months. Um, Should everybody get a pay rise automatically? Well, look, I think it's very hard to say to nurses who've been through what they've been through in the last two or three years, I'm sorry, um, we can't help you at all. Now, I do accept that um, what they're asking for is probably more than can be afforded. I'm not going to be, um, you know, pretend otherwise. But get round the table, resolve it. They've said, look, there's a strike due on Thursday. If the government gets around the table with them, that doesn't need to go ahead. I think most people say, for heaven's sake, um, you know, Prime Minister, roll your sleeves up, get round the table and stop this strike going ahead. We've mentioned nurses. Let's get one on the line. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your call. Kirst is in Gurrock in Scotland. Kirsty, you're through to Zakir Starmer. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, hello, hi. Hi, Kirsty. Um, hi. Hi, hello. Hello, I'm a nurse. I'm a nature intensive care nurse. Um, I just want to ask you is um, what, uh, where do you stand on the issue of the strikes with nurses and why is it that MPs have literally got I don't know, but 28% increase. I think if you go back about 10 or 12 years, it was about 58 grand a year. It's now at 80 odd grand a year, whereas the same time, I've only gone up about 2 or 3% in that same time frame of actually losing money. And why is it okay that it was okay for MPs to get, I think, equivalent of 18, 19% when okay. uh, increased? Yeah. When I, 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 I just have to say, them, although you're a very valid point, MPs actually don't vote for their own pay rises, but let's go over to Sakir Sakir Starmer. Yeah, Kirsty, look, firstly, thank you for what you do as a nurse. I know how tough it is. Um, my wife works in the NHS, so this is a discussion we have pretty well every night. I do know how hard it is. Um, and I want to see nurses paid well. 
Um, under the last Labour government, we had two things. We had fair pay for nurses and we didn't have strikes. And now here we are a few days before Christmas facing the possibility of a strike on Thursday. And Kirsty, I want to see this resolved. I want Would to see the government 19%? around. I, I think 19% is more than can be afforded by the government. Um, but I would get around the table and negotiate something that works for both sides, Kirsty. And I think that's what... Um, I don't know, Kirsty. I mean, everybody I've spoken to in the NHS, and we've got a lot of people in our family and our friends who work in the NHS, nobody wants to take industrial action. Of course they don't. Um, what everybody wants is to use this. We've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday now uh, to say to the government, get around the table, show some leadership, resolve this. Because there's a general sense, Kirsty, whether it's nurses or anything else, that... Um, that Britain is working under this government. Kirsty, let me ask you, how do you view the potential of withdrawing your Labour? Are you happy to do it? Are you distressed? No. Go ahead. No, I, I, it, was really, it was really difficult to vote. I've, I, I never, no, and I still, uh, it's really hard. Right. But the fact is that I feel that we've been taken, we've, we've have been, in, because they think that we, because we've never striked before, we've never done it before, mm -hmm. um, because I feel that we've been used and abused and it's, enough's enough, as they say. Yeah, but Kirsty, you must feel the government, um, you know, there's a three-day window now to resolve this. You must feel strong the government is to roll its sleeves up, get off its, uh, sit, of stop course. sitting on its hand and get around the table and resolve it. That's leadership. In the end, yes. these, 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 all these disputes are going to be resolved around the table. That's how disputes are resolved. Yes. Um, get on uh, and do it is what we'd all say to the government, I think. Kirsty, thank you. Just lastly, on the subject of the National Health, Wes Streeting, just to remind uh, my listeners, of course, the Shadow Health Secretary, he had an interview with the Sunday Telegraph, I'm sure you've had sight of it, uh, and he said that we need to be aware that the NHS is a service, not a shrine, his words, not mine, and it, the NHS, needs to reform or die. Do you concur? Uh, yeah, we've got to reform the NHS, Nick, going forward. Um, you know, and I say this, you'll have heard this before, Nick, my mum was a nurse, my yep. sister was a nurse, my Your wife worked in the NHS, yep. so the NHS runs through our DNA. Um, and of course, you and know, what does that reform take? Well, um, I think that, you know, there's always the question of how much money the NHS should have. But we've got to change the NHS itself. We've, we're all living longer. This is a fantastic thing. We shouldn't see it as a great burden. But it does mean that we've got to get smart about reforming the NHS. I think that means um, intervening and preventing much, much more quickly. Now, with all the data we've got, we can intervene more quickly. We can push health towards our communities. I'm a big fan of mental health hubs in our communities. There's more we can do with technology going forward. We've got to reform the NHS as well as, of course, make and sure that it is properly supported. I also think, Nick, that we've... You know, the, one of the underlying issues in the NHS is if we haven't got enough people. We want to double the number of medical staff being trained. Um, and we say um, the non-DOM status, tax status has got to go. That would free up a lot of money. We could train twice as many people, um, medical staff coming into the NHS. The cavalry is coming. That's the fair choice to make. When Mr Streeting says, and I quote, I think the BMA does doctors no favours when they vote for motions that look like they're living on a different planet and, worst of all, aren't thinking about the best interests of patients, referring to the idea they want to reduce core hours to nine to five. Again, do you concur? I do agree, and I spoke to Wes about it this morning, a very strong feeling that as we reform the NHS, we've got to think about working differently and, and simply saying surgery only between nine and five simply doesn't fit with that pattern. Of course, it's difficult, but what I want to see from everybody as we go into reform, if we do as a Labour government, is a sort of can-do attitude, which is, OK, let's be up for this. But it is going to have to be changed, The you know, intervening early, preventing earlier. We've got the ability to do it now. That has to be part of the change in the NHS. And you want to take the BMA with you because you're going to have a degree of opposition. They say they're working their fingers to the bone. Again, they point to lack of recruitment and indeed a huge loss of numbers as well. So it's as much as they can do to hold the line, Sir Keir, rather than perhaps open weekends or late at night. Yeah, well, I want to take the BMA with us. And what I want to know is what are the problems, what are the inhibitors, what can the government do, but what can you do? We can't have an attitude that says no. We have to know what the problems are and move together as one. And I think... Um, a lot of people will feel with the NHS, they've been through a huge amount with COVID. Um, I often say they're on their knees. If you go in and talk to people in the NHS, they'll say, no, Keir, we're, we're face down at the moment. Right, and right. that's what it that's right. what it feels like. Let's move to other areas. Graham's in Bushy. Graham, your call to Sir Keir. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Hi, Graham. Uh, hi. Uh, since you became leader of the Labour Party, how many peers have you created? Oh, uh, Graham... Uh, well, I think it's about 10, but I can't, I can't remember off the top of my hand. I have a feeling it was 
four and then six. It could have been six and six, something like that, Graham. I'd say about a dozen. I sense you'll know, Graham. Uh, what is the number? Uh, I think it's around 16. Just, just wondering, why have you actually increased the number of Labour peers in the Lords by around 10% to the existing number, when in your manifesto of 2015, 17 and 19... Uh, which you stood on, uh, was your policy to abolish the House of Lords? Oh, Graham, look, I do think that we should abolish the House of Lords. I don't think we can defend um, the House of Lords. Why would you move 16 people into it? Well, because until we abolish, um, the House of Lords has a lot of lot of really important work to do. So, Graham, as you know, we pass legislation in the House of Commons. It then goes to the House of Lords. It gets subject to scrutiny. And lots of improvements happen in the Lords because we've got some very good people in there. That doesn't stop me saying at the same time, Graham, you know, uh, we do want to abolish the House of Lords, but until we do, we need the House of Lords to do the work that it does. But if you have it as an elected uh, chamber, you're going to lose the expertise that's in there, the likes of Lord Winston, John Byrd, etc. They're not going to stand as elected representatives. You're just going to have another load of uh, um, or failed MPs or um, well, people Graham, like career uh, politicians. politicians. Graham, look, there are some very good people in there. I'm not going to quarrel with that. But we've got, I think, over 800 now peers. Um, many of Why them. Why are you added to them? Well, because we do need working Labour peers. Um, we, uh, Graham, as you probably know, we run a what we call the front bench, which is all the people who have to speak on health, on crime, on education. We have to have spokespeople in the House of Lords. Um, and I need good people in those roles doing that job in the House of Lords. In the long run, Graham, I do want to abolish the House of Lords because I think it's very difficult to defend a body of 800 people. And if you look at some of the recent um, appointments on the Conservative side, you've got people who regularly, you know, regular appointments of people who've given, you know, £3 million to the Conservative Party finding themselves in the House of Lords. I don't think many people can defend that. Graham, thank you. Graham, thank you. Let's go to education. Hassan in Slough. Hello, Hassan. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, good Hi, morning, Hassan. Um, Hi, yeah, I, I stood against uh, Dennis Skinner in 2005. Uh, he's a great politician. Um, <laughs> You're a brave man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Hoping to stand again soon. Uh, the question is this. Um, I was absolutely hor- horrified and uh, livid with uh, Labour's plan to abolish the uh, VAT exemption on private schools. So, because what it's doing, although rich parents can actually pay the increase, but it's going to penalise parents uh, uh, of children from disadvantaged backgrounds who are benefiting from this. In the same way, Labour crushed the uh, future of children, um, children's futures, uh, when they abolished the assisted placement scheme in 1997. So why, the question is, why are you penalising these uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds? Oh, look, Hassan, let me take that head on. I want to improve the quality of education in our state schools, um, which are going through a really hard time at the moment. I want more staff in our state schools. I want better standards in our state schools. And I want more support for our state schools. Um, you probably agree with all of that, Hassan. The question I will then get asked quite rightly is, if you're going to do that, how are you going to pay for it? And one of the things yeah. I've been very careful with since I've been leader of the Labour Party with my shadow cabinet is every single time we announce we're going to do something, Thing, for example, increasing the number of staff in um, state schools, we will say where the money is coming from. And I think the um, tax break for private schools, the treating private schools as a charity and therefore not having to pay VAT, is something that can't be justified. And we would use that money directly. So it wouldn't just take that money and put it in a pot somewhere else. It will be used directly uh, for our state schools to improve the quality of education for the whatever it is 90 percent or so of people that go to state schools so that's look uh, Hassan you know politics is about choices um, and priorities and that's my priority let's bring Hassan back in Hassan yeah no thank you uh, thanks for the explanation uh, and I, I understand the sentiment and the value you know, um, sticking to your values about equalising, uh, uh, that's absolutely fine, but he's still penalising the people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I think if Labour is going to be true to its values, then you should be abolishing private schools, as Neil Kinnock wanted in 1987, and grammar schools as well, and pump all the money into comprehensive. But I think, um, final points, if I may, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in, order, cool. in order to equalise upwards, I think we should change all comprehensive schools to grammar schools. Well, um, Hassan, uh, firstly... Um, Look, I mean, I think in terms of... Aspir- I don't want to close down private schools, not for a moment, for starters. But in terms of aspiration, I completely understand your aspiration, Hassan. I can feel it through your voice on the line. That is there for many, many people going to state school as well. Many families have this aspiration um, for, you know... It's a basic thing um, that 
parents had, my parents certainly did, of wanting their children to have the best po possible opportunities to have a better chances than they had. That drives us all forward. That is their absolutely core to our um, state schools as well as our private schools. And may you know, long may that um, you know be the prevailing wish of parents and schools and politicians. When this debate, thank you, Hassan. When this debate came up in the House, Sakir, you mentioned the school that had a rifle club and an extensive art collection. If I were to ask you to identify a school now that has a concert hall, pottery studios and a 32-acre sports ground, would you know the school to which I'm referring? No, Nick, but I'm guessing... It's Rygate Grammar Rygate. School. Right, it's Rygate Grammar School. Let's try this one. An astroturf that's used by the Scottish hockey team, tennis courts, a swimming pool and a health club. That's Fettis College, which was attended by Tony now, Sir Tony Blair. Some would say you're both drawing up the foot, draw, uh, pulling up the drawbridge after you've enjoyed a good education, albeit albeit that you were not fee-paying. Nick, I think um, two or three things in response to that. Firstly, I went to Rygate when it was a grammar school. Indeed. I went as a state pupil I, I and I finished as a state pupil. Quite a lot of the resources that got into Rygate have gone in um, more recently. Um, but look... Um, well, they must uh, have had 32 acres when you were there. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, uh, to be, I, 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 I wouldn't want to quarrel with you, but, but I'm not sure. I think they may have taken on other um, property. But look, you know... I want the best possible education for every child. I send my children to state school. Okay. They went to the local um, uh, primary just up the road and they've gone to local secondaries. Um, and so I believe in in our but, state system. But, but you know and I want that for everyone. They're not rich. A lot of parents who say it is their decision that they don't have a holiday, they don't renew their car, they do whatever they... Because they believe they want to spend their pound on education. They're not... That 20% levy will be enormous in their cases. <laughs> no, I, 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 I do agree and I understand that. There are parents that are saving, you know, hard... That's their choice. Yeah. Uh, to, ...to get their children into a private school because... Uh, that's what they believe will give them the best chance. And I don't in any way diminish that. I would gently say there are, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of parents who, with the best will in the world, simply can't afford it, whatever they do. Um, and their children um, are, are entitled to um, equal and, and the best chance in state schools as well. And if we're going to improve our state schools by putting more staff in, putting more resources, we've got to answer the question how you're going to pay for it. Um, and I think that ending the tax break for private schools, using it directly for our state schools, is a fair choice to be made by um, an incoming Labour government. All right, let me get a couple that are coming in from the text tweets and emails. Pam in Worcester Park, what is your view of Harry and Meghan? Should they return, retain even their titles? And have you watched the Netflix show? I haven't watched the Netflix show. Um, I've been watching too much football in the last we'll get to that. Uh, three or four weeks. <laughs> um, but I, and I'm, I, I'm genuinely loathe to wade in. Politicians wading in um, in relation well, to the has, royal family is, the is a real... Bob Seeley is putting yeah. forward a motion to strip uh, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex of their royal title. So this may well come before you. How would you vote? Look, um, let's wait and see what the proposal is. I think me wading in, politicians wading in, doesn't help. It's a family, it's the royal family, um, and um, I think politicians are a bit too quick to express views. But if you had to vote on it? Well, let's see what the proposition is, Nick. I, I, I think this is Bob sort of... I don't know how many people Bob's rallied round on this, but I'd be surprised to see it on the order paper any time soon. Can I also get a reaction from you on today's GDP figures? I'm sure you've been made aware by your team that the economy has grown, which is good news, by 0.5%, a little more than perhaps some were expecting. But the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, saying it's likely to get worse before it gets better, quotes, there's still a long road to go. So, Keir... Uh, look, any growth is good, um, but this is very, very slow growth, um, uh, far less than what we would want or expect. And this has been the story, Nick, of the last uh, 12 years. Um, low growth under this government has been the Achilles heel. Um, and if this government in the last 12 years had grown the economy at the same rate as the last Labour government did, we'd have tens of billions of pounds to pay on our, for our public services without raising taxes a bit. So I'm afraid the last 12 years has been um, a real um, period of economic failure. Um, obviously, we had the 12 weeks of madness with the list of trusts, which did huge damage to our economy and people still paying on their mortgages. But it's not just 12 weeks, it's 12 years. And I think it's you know, sometimes trying to get the mood of the country. People are fed up. What what have we got to show after 12 years of this government? At the end of the last Labour government, you had lots of lists of things you could rattle off to say, we've done this, that and the other. What have we got to show? We've got an economy which is failing people left, right and centre, got public services on their knees. 
a kind of government that's run out of ideas, run out of energy, and and I think that's why there's a general sense that we've got to have a change. Okay, let's go to the calls. <coughs> Ricky in Leeds. Ricky, you're through to the Labour leader. Go ahead. Hi, care. Ricky. Leeds is about one of my favourite places. <laughs> that's where I went to university. That's where I went to university. Oh, really? Yeah, beautiful city, beautiful city. I've lived here for about 20 years now. But my question to you, Sakia, is um, at the party conference, you said that um, there would be no deal with the SNP under any circumstances. So, if the SNP hold the balance of power after the next election, would you rather have another five years of Tory government rather than do a deal with the SNP? Uh, Ricky, we are not doing we are not doing a deal with the SNP. I say that in capitals. I say it in bold. I said it at my car party conference. I've said it many times um, before and many times since. And so, Ricky, so, so to Ricky's point, you'd rather see somehow the Conservatives limp on in some extraordinary hodgepodge deal than you borrowing five, ten seats from the SNP and getting over the line. So we're, n- we're not borrowing seats from the SNP and getting over the line. No deal. Look, the SNP will have to make their mind up if they want to bring down. Um, an incoming Labour government um, and prop up a Tory government, then that's their choice and that's what they'll have to sell back in Scotland. Good luck with that one. But, the, but Ricky, um, this is fundamental for me. You know, running through the SNP is their mission to break up the United Kingdom and uh, for Scotland to become independent. Um, I fundamentally disagree. I believe in our union of nations, not just because of what we've achieved historically together, but because of what we will achieve in the future. And if I look at the big challenges of our time, whether it's Ukraine and security, whether it's, you know, a pandemic, whether it's, um, you know, how we grow our economy, I can't see or climate crisis. These are issues which will be better um, met um, as a union of four nations going forward together. So, Ricky, absolutely no deal with the SNP. Um, I know, Ricky, what's going to happen as we go towards the election. There'll be lots of graphs saying you, this number of seats and that number of seats. But for, that's what I'm saying up front, tattooing it on my forehead, no to a deal with the SNP. We're not going to do it. Tattooed on Sakir's forehead. Ricky, thank you. Unequivocal <laughs> there, Sakir. Uh, John in Wallington, you're through to Sakir Starmer. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Morning. Hi, morning, John. Nick. Hi, John. Hello, morning. Lovely. Morning. Can I call you, Keir? Yeah, of course you can. People have called me a lot worse than that, John. <laughs> <laughs> OK, mate. But what I, what I would really like to know is exactly what are Labour going to do to stop the illegal migration? Uh, and and are, are you aware of the level of anger that there is when they see people coming across the channel, being put up in hotels, free heating, free food, when British people are struggling and scared to put their heating on? Yeah, John, look, thank you for raising this. Um, We've absolutely got to get a grip of this. The government's completely failed on this. They've lost control of our borders. I strongly believe, John, that um, the way to deal with this is firstly to go upstream to deal with the criminal gangs that are driving this. There are criminal gangs behind this um, that are making a lot of money out of a lot of misery and putting people in boats to cross the channel. The only way to deal with that is upstream. We have the National Crime Agency, as you may know, John, which is the body that would be used for that. We need to work with other authorities across the world and go right upstream to stop these criminal gangs. John, when I was Director of Public Prosecutions running the Crown Prosecution Service, this is exactly what we did. We had um, cross-border teams to deal with drugs, to deal with guns, um, and we need it to deal with people, and I'd have a really hard resolve on that. But, John, we also have to look at what's happening back here. Um, you may have heard this, John, but I found it absolutely staggering that of all the people that arrived by boat in 2021, only 4% have had their asylum claims processed. 4% of all of those that arrived in 2021. And that is because the Home Office and the government has completely lost control of the processing of these applications, which is why you have people in accommodation for so long. So, John, amongst the things we've got to do, tackle the gangs in the first place, and for heaven's sake, clear up what's going on back here. This government is utterly failing us. Is is Albania a safe country? Uh, Albania is somewhere that is safe, and um, I think Yvette Cooper was out just the other day saying that we should have a fast track um, in relation to countries like um, Albania. And so how does right that work? If I come from Albania, I'm effectively turned around and sent back? Yeah, well, you, could, you can have fast track on an assumption that some countries are safe. Albania will, will be one of those countries. So, so Albanians you, you, need to know, you come here, 
You, what if they say they're a victim of trafficking? Well, obviously, you've got to look at the circumstances, but you could have a, you, you could say these countries are in a different category. They can be done much, much more quickly. We don't need to have country details. used to be details. known as a whitelist many years ago. We probably need a different language now, but it looks something such as that. Yeah, that's what Yvette uh, Cooper was putting out there, and we could do that much more. But, Nick, we've got to speed this up because, you know, it, the, the government is... You know, it, it grandstands on this, but it's lost control um, in, in, uh, of the borders. And the number of asylum claims being done is shockingly slow. Shockingly right, let's slow. Let's try and get at least two more. And Tom and Yarm in York, North Yorkshire. Tom, go ahead. Tom. Mr. Stelmer, how do you, how do you feel about um, soldiers having to do the jobs of people who are earning more than £12,000 a year than they are? And this is coming from a veteran who in 1979 had to do those jobs and look at those people, knowing that they were earning then almost twice as much as I was. This is a soldier making, or indeed a member of the military, around £22,000 having to step into various roles. Sakir? Tom, look, firstly I'd say thank you to the military for everything that they do they stepping do in. This? I don't, you know, I don't want them to step in because I want the issues um, resolved. I also know because I've been to see and talk to those involved in these operations in the military. I know them. they will be really worried because whenever they deploy, um, whether it's stepping in this winter, whether it was COVID, the first question they ask themselves, Tom, you'll know this, is how do we get out? Because we cannot get stuck. We don't have the military to get stuck. So they're being asked to go into a difficult situation over Christmas when they would frankly be wanting to spend more time with their loved ones. And there isn't an exit strategy because the government isn't actually uh, managing the situation um, in any meaningful way at all. So um, thank you, I'd say, to them for stepping in if they do, if and where they do step in. But this just underlines for me, Tom, um, why the government needs to get off its hands, get around the um, negotiating you've, table and resolve the situation. You've understandably been very critical of the government through our conversation this morning, but some are critical of your party's very close stance with some trade unions. The Conservatives are suggesting you hand back £750,000 from Unite the Union after reports of potential criminality when it came to the funding of the Birmingham Hotel. One quote moving from £90,000 to a payment of £1.2 million. Will you hand that money back? And does the former General Secretary Len McCluskey possibly need some kind of investigation? Well, Nick, in relation to the investigation, obviously the current General Secretary has referred this to the police. So um, she is clearly cleaning up and um, making sure everything is properly investigated. And there is a criminal investigation, so I'll say not much more about that. But um, frankly, the I Tories coming on air to tell us what we should do with our... Um, money it, it, it has been going on for a very very long time and is not really persuasive for me staying with money and this one is in london i'm sure you're aware that the london mayor sadiq khan wants to expand the ules to the entirety of greater london there are major concerns in the care industry and others that people simply won't be able to afford to work in london do you support the charge i do support what um, the mayor is doing here. To run their cars secure. We obviously we need to accommodate co communities and those that need to travel around, but we do have a massive air pollution problem in this country, um, particularly um, here in London, and we can't keep walking around it. So we do need to take action. We need to work with communities because these are always whenever it needs it, better even, scrappage. Then doesn't it? Sakir? Well, it does need better scrappage. It needs it needs much. One thing. A poor uh, old for, plumber who's got his van, and it's the only way he can make a living. He can't go and get a 25, 30 grand van, Sakir. No, what we, what we, I, I completely get that, Nick. And my sense of so many people is nobody objects to going green in the sense that we all know we've got to do our bit, it would be far better, etc. But most people say, but I just can't afford it right now. So scrappage, yes. What I'd like to see on electric vehicles is um, a government-backed scheme that allows you to pay for it, let's say, over a 10-year period. Because actually, if you take your 20 or 25 grand um, van or car... Over that 10-year period, because you're not paying for fuel, um, it works out a lot cheaper. But up front, it's a lot of money and people can't afford it. So let's have a sensible scheme where, as, where on month on month, year on year, it's not more expensive. In fact, it's less. But the net result is you drive an electric vehicle um, and we do our bit to um, okay. defeat um, the damage we're doing to our environment. And here's the question. Appropriately enough, the last question coming from Wembley. Appropriately enough, <laughs> Lawrence... The question that yeah. I wanted to ask, we're going to leave it to you. Keep it briefly, if you would, sir. Your question to Sir Keir Starmer. Morning, Sir Keir. Hi, um, Lawrence. 
should Gareth Southgate be sacked or should he be? Uh, should he stay on? Now, as someone who has a post that's uh, always open to criticism and always open to review, Sir Keir Starmer, <laughs> Gareth Southgate. Lauren, I think he should stay. I think he's done a fantastic job with this team. What is built with this team is something very special. You've got a team that's working as a unit together. Brilliant youngsters coming through. Bellingham, 19 years old. Absolutely amazing. Saka, amazing. Um, I think Gareth Southgate's done a really good job. I think he leads from the front. Um, you know, of course, there's the agony of England and penalties. I can hardly bring myself to say that again. Um, but look, I think no, everybody who's watched England in this competition, or frankly in the Euros last time round, would be really proud of this squad of players. Um, and um, Southgate has produced the best. When does the, the pride end, Keir? Uh, when does it victory? Come on, it's well, all very well being pride and let, Nick, we now I, dine at the top table. I've heard all these footballs. I, I want to win! I, this is exactly how I play football, by the way, Nick. <laughs> um, I'm not here to play the game. All this stuff about, you know, it's the game and all that. Absolute nonsense, here to win. But look, I mean, I've, I've been doing this with England for many, many years. The agony. I was there in 96 in, in Wembley watching... Gascoigne missed Oh, my God, that was a football star. That was football coming home. But what I do like is the lionesses, the women... Oh, so yeah. so for, for how many? 30 years we've been saying football's coming home and chanting it and singing it. And they said, blow this, we're just going to go gonna and get it, it <laughs> who and wins, get the trophy. Who wins the World Cup now, do you think? Oh, I, I, I'm really... I don't think France, even though they beat us, really? were quite as good as everybody thinks. It's got to be Morocco. Though. Morocco are really interesting to watch them go through. Um, so keep a close eye on Morocco, I'd say. Enjoyed our time together. If I don't see you, can I wish your family a happy Christmas? Thanks, for coming, in. Thanks for coming in throughout the course of the year, Sir Keir Starmer. Here on LBC, where news is next.